This conference will now be recorded. All right, we're going to see today how we can create a VM. What are the standards we need to follow when we are creating the VM? And that must be known. So if you are creating a VM, uh, what is the purpose of the VM? You must know. Without that, you should not provision it. So there are many standards to follow. We'll go through step by step process anyway. So first, yesterday I was talking about you need a minimum of uh, resource group. Right. First, you need a activated subscription, then resource group, then resources in it. Resource can be a VM, a database, a web app, a story account, anything. So anything is called as a resource as service, basically. So now we have subscription, we have a resource group. I am going to create the VM now. So when we are creating a VM, so we need to know a lot of things, basically, as per the standards, you know, what it follows to protect the VM to have the availability on the VM, so all that. So let's go through that. Your subscription anyway, you will find it. If you have multiple subscriptions, select the subscription under which you are going to create this. So each project uh, you know, can have different subscription, maybe different resource groups, it all matters. How your client is designed the cloud infrastructure. That will be shared anyway. There will be run books for which project, which subscription and all will be picked up. Then, resource group i'm using the resource group which we have already i can create anything that i wanted but in the real world as a sql dba we don't create the resource groups generally it will be predefined and you need to load the vm in the existing networks and existing infrastructure basically you don't decide on network side also but we need to understand that and naming convention is very important down the line you build the services like a lot of VMs, a lot of SQL servers. You need to identify the services so quickly to, you know, so that you need to follow certain standards. If it is a production, it should start with the PP. If it is a development, it should start with the DD development. It is a, a testing server, it should start with the QA. If it is a staging server, then it should start with SS. So first two letters of the server or any service for that matter, should indicate the environment first two letters that's what we do follow in, in our environment in the cloud so that we can easily find even uh, you know like a new person join the company also you will easily find and understand the server naming conventions here next first is environment of the server which will indicate first two letters pp dd and qass and the next is location where the server is created in which region so most of our servers we have in East US basically, okay? ES will keep it. ES means East US for us. That is an indication. And we have different servers, CVR and SQL01. This is a, one of the server name you can say. This is going to tell you the, the environment of the server, the location of the server and the project and what is the server count? SQL 01, SQL 02, SQL 03, 4, 5. As we are creating how many servers for the staging, the number will increase. So by looking at the number itself, I can see that, okay, this project have these many staging servers, these many development servers, these many production servers, these many QA servers. So it is easy to find. So conventions must be followed. If you don't follow down the line, managing the resources will become very, very tough. So this is something must be followed in an, every environment for the sake of simplicity you know like if someone joins in your project you can give this kit in one minute even like first two letters will indicate the environment next indicates the location of the vm and the project and the server count it is so simple to understand anyone right for that matter if it start with the pp pp servers you should not touch without the rfc as simple as it is other than that other servers you can deploy the you know anything that the project wanted without an RSC, without an, uh, you know, like board approval. Within the project, you can take the approval and do it. But under production, it must go through the cab. So by looking at the name itself, I don't touch this service because it started with PP. So that way, you can well coordinate with the, even the kind of process the company is built, right? It will become easy for the people to follow. That is very, very important. Any questions on the naming conventions, please let me know. This naming conventions are very important because first in the beginning you might see the less services but down the line the become the infrastructure become robust when it becomes robust finding the services and doing the administration becomes very clumsy seriously 
so you have to be follow the standards from the beginning itself so that down the line the management of the services will become easy for us how it will become easy i'm going to talk i mean how you can search for it what you are looking at so when you know the standards you can easily follow it you know the product you know the environment you know the location you know the project you know the what server you are trying to look for so you can easily search your server and then start working on that that way it will work and the region must be nearest to your client operation center this will change project to project when you move here and there every client will have their own operations in different region you must follow the client operation region so if you look at here 56 regions actually uh, the azure has 56 plus regions in fact some regions are purely dedicated for the government projects they are not showing in the list now they used to show before uh, I, I work you know like since very long i even i started working with the classic portal also classic portal was very very vague this rm model which has a lot of automated functions if it is a classic portal i have to create the disk separately i have to create the ip separately i have to create every dependency separately i have to claim when i am creating the object that is a different story now everything is fully automated you just give it it will build on the fly when you're going through so here what i wanted this is very very important to the region you must create where your client is operating without knowing the operation center don't create it if someone is not guiding you on the where to build the vm you must be addressed by someone it must be addressed then only you build a vm you create a vm somewhere and the business is running somewhere the latency will be there right your you'll pay the network bandwidth because it is it is processing the data too long and also you'll pay for the unnecessarily because you know in you know, one region to one region there are a lot of cost savings you will find it i'm going to talk about that cost optimization also very important especially cost optimization is very important topic in my classes why because i am part of it i do the cost optimization entire infrastructure for our sql side especially i am part of it so next availability option this is a very very big topic for us for now for now i'll spend a lot of time on this what is availability option see there are two things when we are creating the availability a vm so whenever here fault domain update domain what are these two you must understand this will be most frequently asked question in the interview and in the exam also <clears throat> so let's try to understand you have see somewhere cloud is also physical they also have the somewhere infrastructure physical there you are going to create the vm so they'll have the physical infrastructure in terms of racks within the racks you have a physical host within the physical host you will create the vms this is a hierarchy everywhere basically okay this is one of the rack assume a case and within the rack you'll have a big physical host y using the within the physical host you build the vms in fact this is something in fact this is how it is built so now example i'm creating a machine and b machine for the always on okay this is for the always on if I don't tag these servers under availability set, assume a case, availability set, we'll call it as availability. The name itself is saying that, okay, availability set. If we don't tag the server under availability, the probability of server creating in the same rack is possible, okay? Both the servers will go and create in the same rack. If we are configuring always on, and the vms are created in a single rack the rack is down due to software issue the network issue power cable issue unexpected events can happen even microsoft also they will patch the rack and the rack will be down entirely so in that case you will end up you know losing both the servers at the same time both the servers at the same time whenever you configure more than one server for the same purpose this is a condition for using the availability set you when do you use more than one server for the same purpose clustering sql clustering and always on if it is a you know like a web service you'll use a load balancer and behind the load balancer you use a lot of web servers for the same purpose so in that cases you must create the vm under availability set it is mandatory if you are configuring always on always on is so you know reg, you know common feature nowadays in the market they we will create always on to protect the a dr as well as availability both the things you'll get it with the always on so if you are creating a server for always on you must tag under availability set it is mandatory so what exactly fault domain there are two things we need to understand so fault domain value if you look at here there is a two 
what exactly this two two means if i'm creating any server under one fault domain it does distribute the servers into two different racks physical racks here see here rack one which in my case is the rack two this is rack three rack four rack five something like this and here you'll have underlying cable like a power cable network cable right you'll have every rack separately connected underlying now a server got create fault domain what it does it clearly distribute the server into fault domain just follow it i'll take all the questions anyway there will be questions fault domain two two means whatever the service you are creating under the availability set it will distribute the service into at least two different tracks it is mandatory it does internally you don't need to worry whenever you are creating the server under availability set and creating the name maybe uh, vm av set virtual machine availability set something i'm just giving it so here fault domain 2 means it is whatever the service you are going to tag with, this, with the same name all the servers are going to be distributed to two different tracks if i'm creating a third server the third server can go to one of the rack like rack one or rack two it is a probability it can go any of the rack in fact either this one or this one depends on the scope of the resources availability it will create the server in one of the rack but it does not go to other racks it is strictly limited to two racks because you kept fault domain as two so what does fault domain do basically if you are creating the servers under a fault domain it is going to distribute the servers in a phys different physical racks what is the advantage we are getting by distributing the servers into different racks if this rack is down due to hypervalue panel uh, and supportiveness maybe software and hung on the entire rack which is not responding maybe the power cable is down or network cable is disconnected whatsoever unexpected there is some unexpected incident happened the server is down still you have one more server in other rack so one server is enough to serve the data in the always on right one node is down other node is up that is enough to it will take the primary role and then give the data so business standpoint there is no downtime in the infrastructure side there is an issue but business standpoint you are not seeing the downtime so though one of the node goes down other node is protected another physical rack getting the point guys this is important information you need to know again i'll discuss this during the always on configuration with the cloud vm we're going to go through right from the scratch how do we build a domain how do we join the machine into the domain and then on top of that how do we configure the always on with the load balance load balancer integrated we're going to see that but this thing you need to aware of i'm not going to discuss all this again there so i'm going to finish infrastructure first then start the product so when i start the product i'll just call out the options and then move on because we'll spend a lot of time in the infrastructure before i start the product because you need to know all of this before i start the product so availability set is going to make sure that the server distribution to two multiple different tracks by distributing the server we're going to protect the server against the unexpected incidents like power cable issue network cable issue software issue rack issue whatsoever the server is down still you can you can give the data or serve the data to the application this is talks about fault domain what is update domain this is a little tricky to understand fault domain is straightforward but fault domain is the update domain is different so availability set So here we have two things in under availability set right one is uh, update dom fault domain and next is update domain update domain if you look at fine let me make some entries then i'll, I'll show it first uh, a zero at the rack number it will tag it as zero and then one because availability fault domain two right so here also it will be zero and the update domain is five by default so then it is also one i'll explain clearly no need to worry so here this is a very regularly asked question in the interview if you're going to this is oh this is one only you have fault domain two right zero one zero one so it'll it'll go to again the same rack there is no probability of going to third rack here it is two 
here it is one i'll explain what are the numbers i am going to explain three how does the file domain update domain is going to protect the vm is a very important component to understand here again zero because uh, one two three four five it is over five up to update domain is over now it will start with a zero again now again zero and one here it will be one and two this is enough to talk about right so here update domain is something is going to protect the server against the planned events this is about the planned event this is something about uh, let me explain this is fault domain is going to protect against uh, unexpected events okay you cannot expect that that is something happens without without your notice basically right expected events and here planned events both the cases it will cover right so try to understand this entirely so that I'll, I'll take up your questions whenever you are creating more than one server for the same purpose then availability set will apply if it is a standalone server this does not, does not apply it will go and sit in one of the rack there is no probability of protecting it only when you configure more than one server this probability will come into picture okay, if you are creating a standalone does this availability does not make any sense because that machine is going to go and sit in one of the physical rack there is no alternative server for it as it is a standalone whenever you need more than one this concept will apply and for all the always on groups you must tag this one if not you lose the availability so now fault domain is making sure that servers are distributed physically into two different tracks or three if it is supporting the fault domain three so making sure that one of the rack is down or one of the power cable is down for the rack or software is down still you can perform which is protecting against unexpected events this is something protecting it update domain update domain if you look at the what is the value it is giving five what exactly it is keep it five only don't keep the value lower than that so example if we are creating two servers in our case which is okay two servers but what if the case like i am creating one primary three secondaries or four three secondaries which is four maybe four secondaries one primary four secondaries five servers in that case so one server second server third server is going to one rack and the the, the next two servers is going to one other rack so five servers one rack will have three servers one rack will have a two servers out of five right in that case if one server sustained out of all one server sustained you get the primary role if you have a file share i mean quorum concept introduced so at any point of time your availability is available i mean your always on group is available for unexpected events because the server is distributed physically now come back to the update domain update domain is something your server will be tagged with a zero first then one then two then three then four and zero one two it will be tagged like this because you kept a five it will come up to five and then again it will go up to four and four. zero is also counted as one one two three four five right so whenever microsoft to do any updates planned updates like they are they also do the patching on the infrastructure side to protect against the attacks or to keep the things up to updated with the security patches when they do it they'll go with the update domain when the server in the availability is set they only touch the update domain update domain zero first they will apply the patch on the zero once it comes online and made available then they'll pass this one and once this is done they'll pass this one so at any point of time only one server goes down in the update domain not all in the same update domain see in you will create availability set availability set has a fault domain update domain update domain is each server is given a different number and they'll go with if example you have these many servers like four, five six seven eight servers you have as a case eight server concept as a case you have it so in this case when they do the planned out outage in this case they'll patch these two servers out of eight six two are down uh next to next level then they'll go with the one and all ones at a time 
then next all twos okay at any point of time out of eight servers two servers are down in this case in case of three only one is down in case of four only one is down rest all seven are available so when they patch it they'll patch all zero set ones all one set ones but they don't touch you know like all together so that your two servers a b servers in our case a b server a b server the update domain is zero one so they will patch the first one and make available and then pass the b one so planned events also you have the server availability unexpected events you have the server availability even planned events also you have the server availability if you are tagging the server under the availability set so let me ask you any questions from your side any kind of questions please let me know this is very important feature you must know under vm configuration this we do it actually it's our job when we create a vm for the always on anyway some environments the infra team will create it but in our environment we do create because i'm working last seven years for the same project for the cloud in the azure cloud so any questions from anyone please let me know understood everyone what is the availability set what is a fall domain what is update domain so then we how do those number gets assigned like we don't worry about those like how do we know which server is under which fall domain and which update domain hmm actually you will give a name here when you are creating it you are claiming the availability set by default is no infrastructure redundancy but you are claiming it availability set and when you are yeah. creating it here you give a name okay and you will give the fault domain by default to all the regions does not support three basically us regions will support three maximum fault domain three so we don't have to worry what is it is accepting it how many if example i have fault domain three i'm giving it if i'm creating only two servers it is not going to fetch any benefit for us why because two servers it is distributed to two racks if i'm creating third server if it is going to create in the third rack it will give you more availability than the two basically because the servers is going to physically distribute into two different tracks right or three different tracks so the more distribution happens the more availability at infrastructure failure level it can be planned outage at infrastructure level or unexpected event but the fault domain is going to protect against unexpected events by giving the distributing the server into two different tracks update domain is something different which is for the microsoft information every server you create it is zero zero if i'm creating second server one one third server zero two because it will come zero one zero one only because you have only two here but update domain you gave it five it will grow up to five the value will grow up to five as you creating the more and more servers growing up to four and then zero one two three four so when they patch it they'll patch only zeros only zeros across the update domain at any point of time it will pick up they will pick up all the update domains and they'll they will g patch out only zero servers at once and they rebooted restarted made online then they'll start with one so in this case planned outage also is making sure that one of the server is available for your purpose so my question is like we cannot control right which update domain it should get allocated or whatever it is uh, you don't need to control you just have to tag it that's enough tagging okay. is enough you you're tagging it you are giving it it will give first one zero zero next one it will give you one one and third one if you are creating zero again two this will be automatic okay yeah you know, we don't need to control it i'm going to show that how it will be allocated we'll create okay. more vms you get to know yeah thanks but conceptually clear right that is important yeah everyone yeah hello go ahead go ahead sir actually okay i have a question at uh, update domain sir uh, okay. like i'm the fault domains like uh, when we create the vm uh, so basically the v, uh, the system will uh, reside in the two racks okay but right. when the update um, when we go with the update domain uh, like uh, here in the option shows that uh, it will uh, it will be there in five racks uh, actually uh, no it's not a rack it is it is not a rack it is logical i, I didn't, this is something is not a rack 
this is a okay. logical assignment it's logical assignment for each mm -hmm. server it will get assigned it is not a rack this is a rack fault domain is purely rack 01010 it is a rack but this one is a logical assignment so the vm this logical assignment is required for the microsoft to not to bring down all at once when they have to do the patching when they have to do any security uh, update so urgently they have to do right so they should not disturb your infrastructure so that is the reason they, they this logical information for the microsoft not for the rack side okay that means uh, uh, an update domain means when you create the vm uh, the images will reside in the five five places right so the uh, is not uh, uh, five places it's just a tagging it's just a tagging. first server zero second server one third server two it is a tagging which will be given automatically by the availability set this tagging they use it for the updating the infrastructure they only touch first one second one third one one after the other in the rolling fashion so when they when they reboot the server after patch or any fixes from their level so when they uh, so the basic outage will happen we'll see outage when the server goes down from our end or is this so the outage only from uh, the maintenance server maintenance. so server will yeah. go down one server will go down when they are patching it on the zero update domains across the all their infrastructure they'll bring it down they'll apply they'll restart they make online this once it is fully up with this update domain zero they will start with one so when they it is online when they, they 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 shut down this this will pick up the role right automatically yes. so that way, that like, way uh, make... the, okay is update domain is like a high availability like a node one or node two and node three uh, uh it is for our availability node one node three we will build it for microsoft okay. they need to know some some through some means okay the server is part of availability set or this part of always one group this part, this server is actually as a group of some groups have been used on this one. I should not bring down everything so that a business will should not have an impact. So you are instructing the mics of that. Okay, these servers are part of some configuration where I involved more than one server. One server at least should be available so that business will run without any downtime. It is a just logical tagging. Okay. Uh, actually, for example, we have a standalone system, sir. All uh, like we have a mm. system, a sandbox system. Uh, so they want to update the. So so basically, when they create, uh, they by default they will go with the update domain five 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 right, sir. See, a standalone this this concept absolutely won't work. Standalone okay. will get one fault domain, one update domain. That's it, because there is no redundancy for it. So okay. at any point of time, even infrastructure failure or planned outage, the server will be down. There is no concept of protecting it. Only whenever you need more than one, you need minimum two servers, then this concept will apply. Where we need as a SQL DB two servers for always on groups generally. So there it applies. Okay. Clear? Yeah, yeah. Uh, one question is like, uh... If we don't have any control over you know, what is happening behind the scenes, so why do we have to worry about the update domain uh, concept? Do, why? Uh, because you have to. All right, I understand. Good question. You have to have availability, I and mean, you are instructing that you have to worry because you you are configuring always on. Always on means what? At least every time the application one of the node you are serving to the application, so that one node availability is mandatory for you. So to okay. have that one node availability, you must tag under availability set. Yeah, suppose if we have one primary and uh, three replicas, let us say two replicas. So two replicas. Do, will we know in advance which of the replica is going to go down uh, or no. which one they are going to update? No, that they don't tell you. Oh, they, they don't, don't tell you. They only go with the update domain that set. You have three servers, zero, one, two. So at any point of time, uh, out of three, only one yeah. go down. Okay, all we know is that only one of them will be down at any point of time. Right, that's correct. You go, you are right to the point now. Yes, all mm -hmm. we need to know that one server is down at any point of time so that other mm -hmm. servers are serving the business automatically. It's an yes, so this is all happening automatically, right? So why do we have to worry about that uh, in the configuration? Uh, if you go back if to the other... Uh, if you don't if you don't do set the server under availability set the probability of creating both the servers into one rack is possible yeah, that, that part is already taken care with the fault domain right right okay 
then uh, fall domain is serving our purpose that it should uh, not fall be domain is serving is only serving only unexpected events by giving the rack redundancy but when okay. they do the patching they cannot mm -hmm. patch every every server at, at one go right if they do it both the servers are down so you need a reference for it you are the server is part of some availability set so how do i refer it with the help of the update domains only microsoft will refer that okay so in the, the configuration uh, we have to select some num assign num some number to the update domain part? No, no 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 it is giving a number from 0 to 5 means 0 to 4 0 1 2 3 4 0 1 2 3 4 so whenever you go more than five servers uh, this see five is good actually why because if i'm creating three servers assume a case if i'm giving two only assume a case here as you said only uh, i'm giving two two means what the update domain will be given to the vm zero one zero one zero one okay mm -hmm. so here it will be, become zero again one so in this case okay. if i'm creating a third server it will bring down two servers in fact why because two servers are tagged with a zero so five is good actually yes okay. can... i mean they should have taken care of this automatically and without giving us the option of selecting the you know uh, obviously we want uh, uh, you know one server to be not all servers to be down at the same time right? you cannot uh, they don't know right you are configuring a vm it is a standalone okay. vm or a, you are using for a group they don't know you have to instruct okay. them okay got because it. every okay. vm is different right yeah okay thank you yeah any other Ready? question yeah, god please yeah Ravi, one, yeah i just want to check that uh, once we give the uh, information for the fault update and uh, that update one hmm. fault domain uh, can we change it later no it is only available during the vm creation you cannot change it later you must tag it when you are creating itself once the vm is created you cannot tag under availability set anymore so is this recommended by by default uh, so when we you should Microsoft know Azure you project should know. See, uh, we should know what is the purpose. That is the, what I am talking since the beginning. Actually, before you create, you need to know the end-to-end -end purpose of the VM. Is it a production? Is it a pre-prod? Is it always on group? Is it for the database server? Is it a, everything I want to conclude as a standard? You need to know the exact purpose of the VM. Then only deploy a VM. They else don't deploy because it is a cloud and it has some standards to follow. And for standards you must know. That is what we are going through as of now. So for now this concept is clear for now availability set everyone yes what is Good. the maximum for update domain update domain can go to up to 100 also don't give that big number also five okay. is enough if you, are, if you have a two big number maybe 30 servers and 40 servers in that case you can go up to 10 also this value can accept a big number also as you go over 20 is maximum okay fine so 20 is a maximum Ravi, the more yeah go ahead yeah, right. if I have only two servers, mm. I have one secondary, then what is the fault give here? Fault domain is environmental, I mean region wise. You see, in West India, I'm creating the VM, it is supporting only two, the fault domain. You cannot go three. You only US regions can support up to fault domain three. Because if you are creating two servers, two racks are enough. If you are creating third server, it will go to one of the existing racks. There is no further distribution. It will only distribute between no, no, two I mean, I mean only with, without any loss, like uh, high availability. That is what there is no loss in this case, right? We proved it for all uh, unexpected events, planned events. VM is one of the VM is available with the help of the fault domain, with the help of the update domain. Okay. Hi Ravi. Uh, yeah. Actually, we are making uh, difference like uh, fault domain and update domain. So if I make it to five update domain and uh, other uh, are make it to twenty. So is there any cost difference between these two? No, no, no. These are all logical. There is no cost implications on this. This is only logical information you are giving to the Microsoft. This is what I wanted for my servers. This is logical. Nothing you see. You are creating a VM in one rack, creating two different rack doesn't matter for them. You are occupying the same resources there. It is only logical information to them 
to distribute your service it is a fully uh, automated algorithmic function which will take care there is no extra cost for, extra cost for this extra cost will for both the vms like you are creating two vms right two vms will be charged okay it it will be uh, fault only it will make the difference right in terms of cost right right fault domain also don't make you the cost if it is supporting three go to the three it won't add any extra cost this infrastructure see you are not taking any extra thing there you are creating three vms in one rack creating three different tracks there is no meaning for that you are occupying finally the same resource for them right okay no yeah that way it is next availability set is finished right security i'll talk in the networking this now let's leave this part you don't understand security type we will talk about security a lot in the networking anyway then images what is the operating system you wanted generally we will go with the 2019 nowadays right mostly we we are creating servers under windows 2019 data center generation 2 this is the one we are using it across our board uh, nowadays for every new vm but if you want your environment want a specific image you have all the images uh, click on the see images you'll find all type of operating system with all different versions everything you find if you look at here there is a huge you know big list of servers uh, versions you find it so whatever your business is asking just find it and then uh, select it and build the server you wanted unix site platforms you have all that right see cloud supports two different types of operating so one is a unix platform one is a windows windows is the only microsoft one so you can select according to the need and then build the vm as simple as it is what the people are asking this is something comes from the project end what is their application is compatible in the back end kind of for databases mostly windows server to the 19 that is what we are using it maybe if you are working some other one they are going with 2016 also is possible but whatever you wanted you can select all the images when you click on this one azure spot instance i'll cover tomorrow this has something to discuss before i talk talking about it you don't understand i will tomorrow i'll talk some something in the beginning then i'll pick up that point then you'll understand then the size this is where you have to focus a more of focus should go here this is directly affect your billing i'm creating a vm right and this has a different computers in the vm which computers i need to pick up and there is something called you see this vm sizes and categories and families also general purpose family computers and you'll have uh, compute optimized computers and memory optimized computers so see memory optimized computers and uh, you see the here combination of general memory optimized and i'll talk about it what they are uh, first understand you have all of this kind of right general purpose memory optimized and uh, you'll see compute optimized uh, storage optimized all that so first let's understand this try to understand the architecture uh, what i'm going to discuss then we'll understand what uh, where do we have to deploy a vm any company will follow this architecture okay they'll have a load balancer first behind the load balancer web servers are placed because you will have a lot of web servers to take the load not one so multiple web servers one database server at any point of time for the right capacity read can be done from the second but write only one so now this is a load balancer which is a logical logically distribute the data to all the vms equally we're going to see that load balancer i'm going to talk about in our class internal external geographic load balancer all type of load balancer i'm going to show in practical how the load going to be distributed because that's something load balancer is required for always on always on will only integrate with the load balancer in the cloud to start distribute the load we'll see that so here these are all web servers web servers sorry web and this is a database server try to understand if you understand you understand the family so now what i'm doing here is, is am i processing the data here i'm processing the request web server only process the request does not process the data where is the data in fact the web server will contact the app server uh, this is a, again i don't want to go into very big complexity web server will serve the web pages app server will serve the logic business logic if i need something that something will be given to app server app server will execute the query with the database because app server will convert that request into a query and the query will be given to the database and then it will respond to the back to the web server so 
even in the app server or web server you must need a more cpu power it is only processing the request in fact it is not processing the here computing the logical computing is happening here it is not processing the data here also in the app server okay so app server web servers are different basically web server only serve the web pages app server will serve the business logic the logic what it has to compute and ultimately it will give the final query to the database to get the data so now the database is only one and app servers are more again more app servers more web servers behind the load balancer one more load balancer here so now what i mean to here prove is all app server web server need more cp power than the ram because they are processing the request they are processing the a, a logical computation basically so they need more cpu power they don't need a ram at all because they don't cache any data in fact to read the data from the ram but database need more ram all the time the more caching you make it the more quicker response a database server can give it so if you take about our dvm systems you give any amount of ram it will keep occupying the ram why it, whatever the new data you are reading it it will cache the data into the memory the more caching it can accommodate which is called ple page life expectancy the longer the page life expectancy the better the performance why because it is not going to the disk to read the same data again and again deserving the data from the buffer itself so the better ple the better caching it can do in the memory the data the better response it can do so here you need to go with the computing optimized family for the web servers or app server for database you must go to the memory optimized computing family so this is what you need to know all database servers must go into the memory optimized computers because database servers need more memory the memory optimized computers will follow the higher memory less cpus in the compute optimized more cpus less ram so you need to know the purpose of the vm if you don't know the purpose of the vm you deploy anything though you give the higher configuration under compute family for the database server it won't function it won't give you the best results because it is not designed for that you are going to the wrong family so this is one thing you need to know general purpose is something uh, let me open up this document quickly right general purpose computers are the cheapest computers among all other family all pre prods must be built under general purpose to save the cost to save the cost see pre prods people don't invest too much money right memory optimized computers are costly and pre prod also we don't want it we we are not giving it to the business we are only working the pre prod servers in the back end only so in that case general purpose vm sizes provide cpu to memory ratio equally these vms are used in testing and development environment generally testing and development all pre prod must go into the general purpose to save the cost compute optimized so compute optimized will give the high cpus to low memory ratio this type of so vms used in medium traffic web servers application servers anything that part of the web services then go to the compute optimized memory optimized all rdbm services memory optimized vm provide high memory to cpu ratio more ram less cpus the type of vms are used in relational database servers production i mean to here all pre prod database servers also should go into general purpose all production sql servers should go into memory optimized so that they can cache more data they perform well with the data response right storage optimized storage optimized computers are no sql big data platforms uh, like you have a data, uh, data warehousing concept also in sql server right you have a you use ss package to pull all the data from all the servers load into one server wherever you deal with high amount of data transfers or reads and writes go with the storage optimized storage optimized the storage is like a ram it is so quick 2 milliseconds delay when it is writing and reading it so these computers are also costly very costly in fact and they perform very good with the high workloads of read and writes okay whenever you are going or handling data warehousing servers or big data platforms you must deploy that vm under storage optimized gpu optimized this is a very rare anything you are designing an application which is dealing with the gaming application visualization like photos you are loading in the application video you are loading it something visualization related the more graph 
you know graphic processing unit gp unit the better the resolution even in your laptops also when you are buying you need to look at gpu how good it is the the higher the gpu power the more resolution you'll get it the low more look and feel you'll get it so here there is a purpose is already built the family is built based on the purpose you need to choose the right family to load the vm if you if you load the vm into right wrong family you don't get the performance so all database servers must go under memory optimized computers but for now when you practice always go to the general purpose because these are the cheapest computers you practice on the general purpose only but in the live you'll go to the memory optimized computers any questions this is very important you need to know i guess everyone clear if no one is talking fine so now next one oh actually in below what is g series some some series are there actually the series is, will give you the sizes of the computers under family again if you go to d series general purpose it is giving different sizes you wanted some sizes you go to that specific series so it is giving 8 cpu 64 gb ram maximum and the d series if you go to again there are a lot of things right so yes. so it will have its own you know 2d generation and the 3d generation third generation these are the more efficient computers than this one again and this is a little cheaper than this one because third generation computers are little higher side cost this is the okay. third generation this series again general purpose under second generation and third generation the cost will vary because they are the softest latest hardware they are sitting on the latest hardware okay so uh, three indicates it's a generation right generation uh, uh sorry oh like uh, f series v2 d series v3 v2 means it's a generation like uh, generation one generation right two, right right see it is talking about 2x performance boost so this f series actually will give you the good performance for the vms especially and this will follow different to uh, you know billing model especially f2 series if you look at 2x performance boost for the v center processing workload um if this is something which will follow the cpu if example i am not using the cpu accumulated billing model uh, whatever your idle hours can be used during the production i mean if you are if example i am i am adding four cpus i am using only two cpus when i use four cpus there will be only two cpus an average billing can happen on this family there are each family has its own um, uh, advantages and disadvantages okay they'll they'll they introduced like that you know like mostly we will production workload should go to third generation production workload should go to third generation and if you are really wanted something pre-prod uh, with a high scale then go with the third generation for pre-prod also when required okay so but when you practice go to the b series b series general purpose computers the cheapest among all b series computers so ideal workload that do not need continuous full cpu performance so this is for only for learning purpose generally you can use it for production and pre prod also but for exploring things the cheapest computers are available under b series so i'll go with the 2 cps 4 gb ram next the vm does not integrate with any domain by default you have to add it to the domain when you have to add it to the domain you must log in right first you have to enter into the vm to enter a vm you need one login local admin login so this is mandatory you must add this login to interact with the vm when it is not joined to the domain after joining it domain you know you don't need this account you can go through the domain anyway we will talk about that during the always on configuration we will create the vms we'll join to the vm domain we will connect through the only domain accounts we don't use the local account anymore in bond i don't want to talk this this is something in uh, networking see if i'm skipping now we have extensive discussion on that that's why i'm skipping it will divert the topic it is networking related we will spend two classes in on this itself because this is such an important how do you control the traffic incoming traffic outgoing traffic from the vm who should be allowed who should be blocked can be done from the inbound port rules that is a very big topic for us and we'll spend two classes on this for now i'm skipping it if i'm skipping anything we absolutely have a discussion in the future i don't leave any single feature no need to worry i'll explain you every single point 
that we need to aware of as a DBA. Licensing, this is what I was saying. Hybrid, if, I, if I'm unchecking this, let's see the cost. What is the cost? 3702. I have the already Windows Server running in the on-prem. I wanted to get the hybrid benefit. You are you are in the hybrid benefit, right? You are running the Windows software in the on-prem. You have a licensing key. Use the same licensing key. You get the bill down. See, 37231. 600 is down automatically. If I uncheck that, I don't have a license again. Then it'll, it'll become 37. See? Did you guys see it? The bill is coming down. They are giving you hybrid benefit straight away. You guys following? Yes. They're encouraging. They're encouraging to come to the Azure Cloud to, by giving these kind of discounts. Discs, again, there are three different types of disk. I'll spend entire tomorrow class on the disk itself. For now, I'm moving ahead because we have other topics to talk. So disk, I'll spend two classes in the disk area itself. This is also very, very important. We can uh, build the VM. We can automate the VM configuration with using the disk. We can build the golden images. We can do a lot of things with the disk. We will talk about two classes on the disk itself. Networking also, I'll spend networking model. Leave these two tabs for now. I'm not leaving anything. Don't worry. Anything if I'm leaving that has a clear cut discussion in the future. I don't leave any single point. No need to worry. Right. This is something very important, guys. Monitoring. Monitoring a VM with enable with the story account is, is a good idea. Some people don't do it, but do it, I would advise. What exactly it does boot diagnostic? What is the booting? The server starting time. When you you try to reboot a machine, it is not responding. Why it is not responding? How do I know? I need to know the reason to take the action actually. So when you enable the boot diagnostics, the server when it is trying to start, it is not able to start. What for what reason it is not able to start? It will write the exact log. That log is needed to take further action. So Boot diagnostic must be enabled. How do you read the boot diagnostic log? We we have a topic. I mean, you enabled look good enough, but how do I read that log to understand why it is actually uh, hung in the background? It is not responding for anything at all. Why it is hung? It will write any information in the boot diagnostic log. And how do you read the log? We will see it for now. We will enable it. We have the topic towards it. Identity management comes AD and identity management comes in the active directory. These two are the separate one class discussion. I'm going to build an active directory. I'm going to migrate and and map the accounts to the services uh, to do the actions. That's something comes under identity management. Auto shutdown. This is comes under automation. We have automation like using the automation. You can shut down the VM start the VM. Why we need to shut down? Why we need to start through the automation? We have a justification there. We'll talk about. I mean, these are all topics which comes in the future classes. I cannot conclude everything in one class, right? So they have a respect to modules, respect to discussion. VM is made up of everything. Everything is integrated into VM, right? VM is just an object. It's a just logical object. It is integrated with the network. It is integrated with the storage. It integrated with everything that is. It is going to come to the VM. So we need to aware of all of that. Auto shutdown comes in the automation backup. Uh, recovery comes in the storage and these parts whatever i'm leaving i'm not leaving don't don't worry we have extensive discussion on each one guess who is this is something do you want the vm to be patched by the microsoft see microsoft will anyway patch their underlying infrastructure not the vm within the vm they don't connect to the vm and do it kind of they do from the hardware layer itself so they can Patch your Windows Server if, if you want it. Automatic OS upgrade by the Microsoft. Do you want it? We are not using it. We are going with the manual itself. What is the problem with the automatic? There is a problem with it. What we felt in our environment. We gave to the automatic, but during the schedule, their schedule, our client deployment are actually clashed. And they, they restarted the servers without the client notice because we have a given window. We asked them to do the patching and their regular window so the client also had the same deployment server went down then he asked us why it went down so it is a patching from the microsoft they said like why why don't we control it then we change the entire infrastructure to manual when we want it we apply the patch our info, info team will do it if if there is a clash they can postpone they can postpone the patching activity they can control it with the project team they can coordinate well coordinated and do it. If you do the mics up, they don't co coordinate. They'll push it. 
automatically there is a huge you know number of clients are there following with every client and doing the patching absolutely not possible for them you give a window they'll follow it you should not fall your deployment during that window but sometimes business demands it you need immediately to serve the business you can postpone your patching right that is the reason we are going the manual updates in our project our windows team will patch all the cloud vms even microsoft can do but clashes comes microsoft does not care they you given a window we'll follow it we don't care about your deployments getting the point it's very important guys is it clear why you guys so silent it is clear right yes <laughs> Good enough. So now come to this. This tab is very important for us to understand many things. Extensions. A VM need an extension. I for SQL servers you never install any extension. For web servers from different servers people do install. But SQL. But let's talk about it quickly if you want. So go click on the extension. This third party softwares or Azure software extra plugins you need on top of the VM. You need extra so software or extra agent for the VM for some particular application need. You select this and hit next it will get applied to the vm automatically and sql servers i never seen creating or installing any extra plugin but anyway it is a need based you can click on this whatever the extension they wanted they'll mention in the request you have to just add that extension and build the vm that's it vm applications in preview it is a preview means recently given even i did not see this what is the purpose of it custom data it's for the unix platform generally we will when the vm created it will run the script on default script and whatever it has to enable it will enable it generally this will be used towards a unix platform or app server web app servers so they wanted to configure something or enable something kind of sir uh, so actually um, in on premises uh, when the build was by infrastructure team generally they will install antivirus and some monitoring tools uh, mm -hmm. Right. But in Azure, so when we create the EM extensions, means adding the this additional softwares like uh, monitoring, monitoring yes. and just like exactly, exactly, kind of an agent. It's not a monitoring, but uh, it's something an extra uh, software which is needed by some applications for that matter. Okay. It's not all the case. You don't install on DB. I never seen. I mean, the entire my career, I work. I'm working since very long. But SQL side, we did not in, in install anything with our client maybe some extra features it's environment specific it's not a standard basically it's a requirement basis that's why it is not made default you have to pick it as required then uh, this custom data is something you provide a script here it execute that script when the vm get built automatically and host group this is something we need to understand this is something uh, host group host you had to you wanted to buy a physical host than a vm so let's come back to this topic so i said a rack rack will have a physical host within the physical host you will build a vms i don't want this i wanted to buy entire host this host entire host i wanted to buy as an individual user you cannot buy only corporates can buy it comes with a minimum 64 cpus and the 512 gb ram very big physical host right and this physical host you wanted to buy as an individual user you cannot buy unless until you go and raise a case with the microsoft i need it specifically you have to raise a case but by default they don't allow you to buy as a pay as you go workload pay as go workload cannot buy a physical host only corporates can buy but how do they buy what is a benefit or what are the disadvantages we have let's talk about that let me show you this first uh, something hmm. not here i guess i wanted to show the cost involved with the physical host it's loading that no i don't want that ah oh, this is exactly is it the one no it's not talking about that Estimate. Maybe. Uh, 
I wanted to show that right here. It will get it. So pricing under pricing, uh, there is a product under product. You click on here. Compute under pricing under product. Click on the compute and the compute. You'll find the dedicated host. I see. Compute. Oh, where it is. I still sell virtual machine. And not on the computer. It is next to batch. Second line. Ah, right here it is. Sorry. Good. Thank you. So dedicated physical server to host your Azure VMs for Windows, or Linux, or Windows or Linux, whatsoever. You click on this, it will take you to the sizes of the dedicated host available in the cloud. Okay. Come on. Azure dedicated host. And pricing most probably. Right. Oh, this is exactly what I was looking for. Just information. Don't worry about this. You don't need to practice to receive this kind of. So now you wanted to buy a physical host. Physical host, if you look at this, is coming with the 112 CPUs and 768 GB RAM. It is too big machine. 112 CPUs and 768 is not a small machine, it's a big machine only. And you wanted to buy this entire physical host. This is a cost per hour. You see this one pay as you go if you raise a case with a microsoft i need it badly then they'll allow you to buy by default you cannot buy and if you reserve for one year 41 percent saving if you reserve for three years upfront you have to pay it you have to pay that amount for three years before then how much you saving you're getting 62 percent seven dollars to two dollars look at the uh, the cost how deeply the discounts are given when you preserve a resource, you pay upfront, means you pay before itself, and then reserve for these many years. So if you cancel in between, you'll not get the money. That is also there. That is why they're giving the cost at the deeper discount. You paid three months, your business is gone for after one year, you will not get the two years. You paid it means paid, because that's why they gave the deeper discounts. Okay, that is there. You reserve a VM, use it, you don't use it, doesn't matter. You paid, you're gone. That's it. But anyway, you need to expect. Is it like a one year business or three year business? You need to expect and buy. So that's something is there. So you wanted to buy a physical host, you can buy it. See, it comes with a very big sizes basically. So uh, from this one, you wanted to one no, two CPUs 8 GB RAM, two CPUs 16 GB RAM, four CPUs 20 GB RAM. You can go with the custom choices because it's your physical machine. You can build the size that you wanted out of the physical host. Whenever you see some size is not available in the cloud, but people are building it, that comes under a physical host. They are buying the physical host and they're building their own custom sizes, basically. This must be uh, you know, bought before you build a VM. There should be a physical host available in your subscription. It should display all the physical host the client bought, client already purchased. You will find it. You select it whatever the size you select that size will get deployed into that physical host automatically so anyway uh, we don't have we had this kind of concept with the old client we had one of the client he left with us is not there with us anymore but with that client we had a few physical host the big problem with the physical host is there is no availability set if one physical host is down all the products on that physical host will be down there is no protection there is no something kind of Azure dedicated host allow you to provision and manage physical server within our data center physical server you're ordering a physical server entirely that are dedicated to your Azure subscription a dedicated host gives you assistance that only VMs from the subscription are on the host flexibility to choose a VM subscription see whatever the size you wanted you can choose it but there is a something select a host group choose host group from within that group host group must be in the same region an availability zone the vm you are creating this is okay but it does not allow you the availability set a host group cannot have another host group as a standby if one vm is one rack is down all the servers on that rack and that vm the physical vm is will be down physical server will be down that is a disadvantage capacity reservations how long you wanted to reserve this something capacity reservation allow you to reserve the capacity for virtual machine needs if you wanted to reserve this, you had to pay more upfront. 
in advance then you can hold the resource this is something you don't do it the capacity reservation should be done by the sales sales team only then proximity placement group this is very very important this is absolutely important what exactly the proximity placement group let's talk about it one region is made up of hundreds of data centers it's not one okay one region equal to in india entirely there are three regions so three regions doesn't mean that three data centers no it is hundreds of data centers so let me explain how it works each one is a data center here what i'm making a block so you need to you need to know the standards guys standards without knowing standard don't work on anything please cloud is something is not cheap if you make mistakes you'll pay unnecessarily that's what cloud is that's where i'm going to make you you know aware these are not good these are good these are not good these are good as we move on so you have to pay attention when i'm talking all that right so now these are all data centers okay this is a region what we are talking about this is a region the entirely within the region these many data centers it is it is usual one data center is made up of one or hundreds of data centers in a within a region in a single region there could be hundreds of data centers it is possible so now they have defined they have defined this something how do i draw this it's coming with the line okay fine what do it is so so uh, this data centers are serving one size there is a definition they have made already so you cannot do this anything at all it is already predefined these three data centers are serving one size and uh, maybe these three data centers are serving just for the case of discussion so now this is serving two cpus by 4 gb ram this serving this data center serving 8 gb 8 cpus into 32 gb ram this data centers are serving uh, 16 cpu into 64 gb ram randomly and you have more big machines maybe these these are serving the purpose as you make it these data centers maybe i have 32 cpus and uh, 128 gb ram so based on the size of the ram the the data center will define you cannot go and ask that i need a vm in this data center you only select the region but region is made up of very big region very big area in fact 500 600 miles it covers one single region so now i'm ordering a vm into 2 by 4 for the same project i'm ordering the vm for 8 by 2 for the same project i'm ordering the vm under 32 by 128 gb ram for the same project so each sizes if you look at they are physically two different region different locations in fact so what i'm asking is one project one ppg proximity placement group the name itself is proximity what does it do when we are creating a server for entire project for entire project it can be a database server it can be app server it can be web server it can be uh, pass services anything you must tag under that ppg what does ppg do ppg try to if example if i'm create a first vm first vm got created here second vm got it randomly here third vm got created here and fourth vm here somewhere here so these vms are physically too far within the region to communicate these vms in the background to exchange the data it, there will be latency because they are located too far away if you tag these servers under ppg proximity placement group what exactly it does it will try to bring the servers together it will try to create the servers together if i create the server under ppg server it will create here next server under 80 it will create here itself it does not go to the next because this is the nearest data center if i go to the this size it will create a server only here because this is the next immediate uh, see if you look at this one here this, in the in this uh, you know the family in this family means in this size this is the vm this is a vm it is too near one to other and this is the nearest one for that size if i build a vm here it will too far it is the nearest one 
if i have to go to the next vm it will create here which is the nearest one see so it was scattered before now they are not scattered they try to close together try to it is trying to create the servers in the background as closer as possible servers cannot be sit in a single data center it's not possible because you are creating different sizes of servers as you create different sizes servers get scattered across the data centers when they scattered the inter vm communication will become a latency if too far we are asking the microsoft by choosing the ppg ppg you have to create beforehand it is simple anyone can create it just uh, it, there is no cost for this there is no cost for the ppg you create a ppg tag the ppg for every resource you create it will try to deploy the vm as closer as possible like this it won't scatter the resources catching the point it will make the inter vm communication better why because it won't scatter too far it will it is created here means it will create the next vm here only because in this range it is the nearest one in this range this is the nearest one in this range this is the nearest one to, to this so it will have it will try to keep the servers as closer as possible so that the uh, inter vm communication would be good in the background it's a background you don't see this but you need to understand this how it really works you guys following what i'm trying to say yeah say something yeah. right good enough so these are all standards what we are talking about if you miss any standard you lose the performance as simple as it is so knowing the standards important working is the next thing i'm going to cover up that i'm going to cover but building a vm under all the standards is very important if you don't do that you lose the performance now see this cost 5 rupees for this vm so i'm going to build the vm in now i'm going to destroy right after the class how much i'll pay for it i'll pay for 20 minutes 20 minutes it is a per minute billing per minute billing always as you follow the per minute billing so if it is 5 rupees for 20 minutes uh, roughly divided by 3 1 point to 30 paisa i'll pay it so like that 1 rupee 30 paisa so that's how you create it and destroy it after the practice anyway so i'm creating the vm there are a lot of things said to be discussed i i did not discuss everything because they are actually uh, comes in the respective modules we have a lot of modules we're going to cover uh, topic by topic and point by point right we discussed few possible options today and then as we move on topic by topic the whatever the leftover topics i'll discuss in detail how they are integrated how they are going to work basically oh come on i would have shown this any resource which get deployed in the cloud it goes through three stages in fact one is the uh, installation submission deployment this is will be regularly asked question in the interview in the exam also any service that get deployed into the you know whenever you provision it goes through three stages installation submission deployment if you wanted to keep in mind this keep isd in mind isd isd calls you know right isd installation submission deployment keep in mind that that is important it takes hardly 2 minutes to uh, provision the vm at most and you'll see it it is at the moment it is building it creating the status right uh, if possible you guys can create the subscription today or tomorrow and start doing the practical tomorrow we will run through a lot of workshops a lot of practicals so basic things as we move on i mean tomorrow practicals are very important so slowly in, you can create a subscription today or tomorrow right after the class and start doing the practicals along with me okay so one month you know you just do what i am doing it that's enough everything is like a, i don't give assignment because i cover all the things you just follow me that's enough you'll see a lot a lot of scenario based discussions every time we'll we'll go through the scenario based scenario that's how you learn right the vm got deployed uh, this is what it will tell you the bell symbol deployed if it is failed what reason it is failed you have to go and verify it we will see that some errors will come in the future then 
we'll talk about how do we really troubleshoot go to the vm and then connect to the vm it is connecting by default because there is a rule opened here what is the rule we will spend in the networking itself just pick up the ip and then i can msdsc and then give the ip it will connect how it is connecting what is making us to communicate that's something we will talk in the networking itself that takes quite long discussion because i need to run through basics right from the basic how do you create a network how do you segment it to subnets subnet into host ip and then how you make one host to another host communication subnet to subnet network to network region to region two classes will spend on that side you get a fair idea how networking works even in the on prem in the cloud absolutely and what to look at when there is no communication at least right so we build this server right to cps and 4gp ram uh, come on it's taking time to load up anyway so this is all about uh, today tomorrow we will talk about a lot of workshop i mean uh, real time scenarios how we can handle things in the real time using the disk based operations slowly things will move towards you know one of the other. next we will enter into networking side then storage side then product once i start the product i'll recall all the discussions that we have done i don't come back to the basics again because that's why we are paying attention towards basics and standards so now um, one thing uh, how do i know that this vm is scaling with ivo with a given current ivo is is good or not how do we know anywhere you wanted to find ivo is good or not you can go to resource monitor here you'll find disk response time this good is or not you'll find under disk and a disk response time is too high this is a high disk response time should be generally less than 10 minutes 10 milliseconds in fact hundreds is not good hundreds is not good this disk is not good in fact by looking at this uh, numbers itself i can say that this disk is not reading well because of the the response time whatever it is trying to do a program the program is waiting for these many milliseconds to get the re required data this response time talks about how much time the io is waiting for get the uh, data for that uh, service to process it so this response time is not good if you look at these values are absolutely bad now if i go to my laptop my in ssd drive if i look at my drive or uh, statistics here anyway i'll talk about this tomorrow just information here today we can find a system is performing is well or not it is simple we're going to see that and a disk activity if you look at the response time you see this one five millisecond this is very good disk how do i say this the response time is within mil 10 milliseconds is good up to 20 is okay beyond 30 is bad your disk is not good it is not doing good with your the kind of data retrieval you're trying to require and what the disk is re responding back the delay that uh, the disk is taking to respond to your IO request. This is a response time. Anyway, within the SQL server also, we can find all of this just for the information. Anyway, I'll, I'll, I'll touch base all this tomorrow as well. So in the SQL server also, you can find it. So what's going on with your IO? IO is good or not? Uh, the SQL server is uh, really scaling with IO or not? So simple, any metric, so simple guys. I'm a performance engineer. I do work on a lot of performance escalations. And anything any bad system i make it good that's what is my profile anyway so if i go to here uh, activity monitor so now if you look at the data file io and you see the response time for every query that you're running every single query till right so you have series one tmdb doing something it is taking five millisecond and let me show something just for the sake of discussion just let me one give a minute one database is big here okay what is 9 gb okay this one report topic 
usage disk usage by tables i'm looking for the big table in the entire database i'll try to read it db.post has hmm, 6 gb of data it has 6 gb of data if you look at come on really okay let me read that table what does it do what was it dpo.post right post right db is not required and it will call the default just a post posts fine so if i go and read this and as it is it's not good it's absolutely not good you're reading such a big table without any conditions and uh, just giving asterisk it reads every single record so if i run this and it is reading from somewhere <clears throat> this query is here stack overflow it started working on this the disk response time for that is four millisecond and i run this query the query is running on this file and the file disk response it is reading 44 mbps per minute per second sorry Per second everything is per second 44 mbps and it is giving the response in two milliseconds this disk is absolutely good i can say that 46 mbps per second and it is giving the delay of three milliseconds it is a ssd drive my laptop has so that's how you measure the disk response is your disk is good or not though you give the high ram high cpu but your disk is delaying for the read writes it will get delayed by default you cannot do anything the cpu memory is ready to do it but the disk is not doing it it's not loading the data what processor can do what memory can do so there are a lot of interdependencies on the performance tuning uh, anyway uh, when i start my performance tuning class you i'll inform all of you you will get end-to-end -end expertise that will be very interesting topics we do cover there but anyway uh, the disk is good or not by looking at the statistic you can say that your SQL server is scaling or not with a current disk, you know, model, you can easily find it on the fly. You see this one, it is growing. The read capacity is still growing, but it's not increasing the response time. That's the that's how you measure a disk is good or not, what the underlying where the data is placed. Same thing, it is 6 GB drive, 6 GB data. What I'm reading, it see, it's still executing. I do have a high configured laptop anyway. Uh, this is like a server. I have 32 GB RAM, eight processors, and two TB SSD drive. And that, that's why it is scaling well, absolutely scaling well with the high IO request. Anyway, that's all for today. Any, uh, let me show one thing quickly. Uh, come on, virtual machine scale set, right? Set L. Quickly, I mean, uh, when I discuss more uh, VMs, then you get to know more. Availability set is not deployed. Just a minute. I did add it, right? What? It is not applied for some reason. Okay, we'll see tomorrow. No need to worry. I'll deploy. I'll show that how availability look like and what is a. Uh, a fault domain number what is update domain number i will we'll build few servers and then see it during the disk operations I'll, I'll show that anyway i have to build more servers there to make you understand then i'll show that how the numbering i was showing how it look like when it comes to the portal how these numbers will be assigned this was a question right we will see in practical don't worry don't worry about it we'll talk about it. right so i'm stopping the recording <laughs>